What is going on, my people? It's great to be with you today. We just hit our one year anniversary of Seeking Excellence, which to me is absolutely crazy. I know um, it's just kind of just flown by. I think this transition pretty fast and, and crazy for all of us, but uh, it's definitely just wild to think that we've been doing this for a year now, podcasting, doing the blog's been for over a year now, but kind of the rebranding and all the things that have kind of gone down over the last year has been a lot of fun, social media, you know, it's, it's been a cool, it's been a cool experience for sure. And so I've had just a blast doing it, got to connect with a lot of people. We've hit almost 30,000 downloads on the podcast, you know, which is, which is awesome. Um, And and looking forward to the future and really want to continue to grow the ministry, you know, share our message with the world, try to encourage people to pursue their best in every area of their life, you know, not section off which areas they want to try in, which ones are going to disregard and let, uh, you know, just grow disgusting and, and we could, uh, you know, be the, their ruin. And so we want to avoid that for people. We want to help people pursue heaven, you know, shoot for this modern day holiness, which obviously looks a lot like traditional holiness, but I think does have some unique aspects of our time. There's some, some unique things about our time that uh, require a, a somewhat unique approach to holiness when it comes to being a good steward. You know, I often point back to that that parable that Jesus gives of of the talent. You know, and, and Jesus uh, talks about you know the person who entrusts a different number of talents to one he gives five, to one he gives ten, to one he gives one, um, and what they do with those is really important. And so he just kind of emphasizes it, 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 the importance of stewardship and being good stewards taking extreme ownership of the things that God entrusts us. And so as modern day American Catholics, that's a lot of stuff. We have a lot of things that are entrusted to us from relationships to our money, to our professions, to our families, our spiritual lives, our souls, obviously our bodies, our minds. There's so many things and we have access to so many things to really multiply those talents that people didn't have access to for a majority of the the existence of the church. The majority of these 2000 years, People haven't had access to fitness centers and the nutrition awareness that we have now. People haven't had access to, you know, investing on their phones and budgeting on their phones and these easy things that make it simple for us and YouTube videos that teach you how to do all these things. So I think it's important for us to recognize that. And that's why we do what we do. That's why we try to encourage people to grow in these seven pillars, mental, emotional, physical, financial, professional, social, and spiritual. So I think that that that's what we're trying to do, right? And so um, I really just want to take a moment and just reflect, not just on the things that we've done or things we've accomplished or anything like that, but I want to talk more about things that I've learned since starting Seeking Excellence. I get a lot of questions from people asking about how to start a podcast, how to start a ministry, how to start whatever, how to start working out more, how to start reading more, how to start you know growing in discipline, whatever it is. And so I've you know, been a little bit more intentional about trying to live this life of seeking excellence since we started, right? Naturally, since I'm the spokesperson of it, the face of the organization, there's obviously a whole team of us working on this stuff, but, um, you know, you hear from me the most. And so I try to be a little bit more intentional and, and purposeful in how I live my life and trying to live that seeking excellence lifestyle. And I think one of the first things I want to share is that, you know, I'm really still figuring it out myself. And I think that we all always are, right? So, what I strive to create for Seeking Excellence is I try to fill a need that I think really exists in the church. And that need is that I don't think we have a clear picture of the outcome that we're trying to create, right? And obviously, it's not just we're trying to create, we're working with God to create this person that you and I are going to become, this man or woman that you and I are going to become. Um, but at the same time, it, it help, it's helpful to have an end goal, right? Obviously, God has the end goal in mind. I think that we need to Pray and discern with him exactly how that looks in our life because tithing is going to look different from each and every one of us. Our physical fitness is going to look different for each and every one of us. You know, our, our learning and, and what we're growing in, our professions are going to look different. So there's a lot of customizable pieces to seeking excellence. And so, I, you know, I know there's sometimes pushback when you talk like that and people will say, well, you're not creating yourself. Like you should let, let God create you. And it's like, for sure. But we cooperate with that and we you know, God wants our cooperation. He wants our active participation. There's not just this, oh, I'm just going to, you know, show up to mass on Sunday. Even if you pray every day and do all those things, it's just like, I'm just like, God, take care of everything. It's like, no, dude, you have to like be the one to set the budget up. 
you have to take your own ass to the gym. Like he's not going to just magically transport you there and make you fit and healthy. Uh, you know, you have to do the work to, to learn what, what are your emotional blind spots so that you can stop overreacting to things and being anxious and, um, you know, casting that anxiety and stress on other people and, and lashing out and being angry all the time. Like you have to do some of that too. Now, God will heal you, obviously. He wants to heal you. But I think we have to recognize the importance of our active participation. And there is a lot of uniqueness within that. And so I think the main thing is not realizing, you know, not me trying to say, or just knowing that we're not trying to say that um, this is a one size fits all. We all have to do this the exact same way. No, the, the, the thing is that we're, we're emphasizing, you know, there's different ways to pray, but we all need to pray. Our budgets all look different, but we all need to budget. Our fitness routines look different, but we all need to be active, right? Our relationships all look different, but we still want to be in good, healthy, holy relationships. Our learning and growth and, and personal growth and mental toughness will look different based on who you are and what you're doing. Your profession will look different, but you should still give your all and do your best in it, you know? So I think that's, uh, that's the main thing that I, I want, you know, to kind of lead with and, and just say that this is about us all trying to do this and figure this out for ourselves and what that looks like. But I think you have to recognize that you're always going to be kind of trying to figure it out for yourself, right? We're committing to this. We're going to give you a lot of resources, a lot of content to, to kind of help with that. But like I said, I'm still figuring it out. And, and the reason why you're going to always be figuring it out is because your life is always changing. And I think a lot of times people run and they hide and we hate change, right? Um, I once heard a great quote. I once heard Matthew Kelly say that human beings don't actually hate change. We just hate the transition time in between, which is super true. Having just moved from Kansas to Denver, uh, you know, those two months were really, really hard. And I mean, really tough, right? Like I was hitting some low points. We were struggling big time. Um, Emily really helped me through that. She was such a blessing as always. But it wasn't the change that I hated because I love being in this new place. I love being in a new apartment. I love having a new job. I love being in a new city. Like everything was an upgrade, right? So everybody, we like change. We like changing things. We just hate the crazy time that's in between point A and point B. And so we have to recognize and, and start to acknowledge and accept. And I feel like I've done that in my life and it still doesn't necessarily make it easier um, or more simple, I guess you could say, but it does allow you to process things, I think, in a better sense and to be more prepared when change comes because change is going to come. It's going to happen to you. Now, I think of a lot of people that I know who have had some pretty consistent lives over the last five to 10 years, right? I obviously have not. I've moved a ton. Since we started Seeking Excellence, I've moved twice, like 600 mile moves. Uh, 600 miles, I think like 400 miles or something like that. Like I've moved a thousand miles two different times, um, you know, and that's hard. You know, I was living in Cincinnati when we kicked this thing off, moved to Kansas for eight months and now live in Denver. I've also had three jobs during that time. Um, I was in a different, or I had just, or I've been in the relationship with Emily the whole time, but I was uh, coming out of a different relationship, you know, several months before that. Um, and living in different apartments, uh, had a different car when we started that thing, you know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of stuff that changed. And so I think even my friends, you know, like uh, close friends and, and made new friends and haven't talked to friends since it started and all kinds of stuff. And so there's been a lot of change. And I think we have to recognize that and just take that head on because life's always going to have that. And every time your life changes, it's kind of like, you know, a good analogy could be going to a new gym or to stick with the budget, right? If you start a new job, unless you're making the exact same money and you're in the exact same tax bracket and locations and all that stuff, your budget's going to change, right? And even as your budget, even as you grow older and you do different things in life, that could change your budget as well. Um, but the, the things are going to change as you encounter these new waves and new chapters in your life. You go to a new gym, your workout routine is going to be different. You might do the same workouts, similar stuff, but your, your order of, of operations, at which machine you go to first, where you warm up, all that stuff, you have to figure all that out, right? You have, to, you have to start everything kind of from scratch and kind of, you know, you're like, I have some baseline, which is good, right? It's not like you're going to a new gym every day for four days, but you have, and, and it's not like you've never worked out before. So you have like some semblance of idea of what can I do 
But the good thing about being fit, which is what I think developing the seeking excellence philosophy and mindset does for you, is you have that baseline that allows you to get creative when you're in a new environment. So when you're in a new circumstance, you know how to get creative, how to make that use of your time so that you're continuing to grow, continue to move forward, continue to get closer to God, and thereby growing closer to the person, the man or woman that God's calling you to be, he created you to be. So I think all that's really important to recognize, you know, and I like to say that, you know, and I hope I never do figure it all out because then I won't have any content to share because every time I learn a lesson or things like that, that's how I podcast, write, things like that. So it's kind of good, you know, that we're continuing to learn. And I, I try to encourage people all the time in every talk that I give to say, usually when I, when I pick my topic or when I write for a talk, um, I'm either reflecting on things that I have learned or I'm thinking of what do I need to hear today? right? That's kind of my only two, my only two methods for picking about what I'm going to speak right about. And so today's going to be more reflective, but typically I'm speaking about, all right, what does, what does Nathan need to hear today? What do I need to hear today? If I was speaking to myself, which I am right now, um, you know, looking at myself on Zoom, recording this podcast, what do I need to hear? And so that's, I think, something that's really important uh, for everybody to know as well, is that it's not this, yeah, I guess it's just not this, uh, you know, I feel like I've crossed the finish line or I'm looking back. No, I feel like I've just been blessed by a lot of uh, wisdom and people pouring into me and books I've gotten to read and podcasts, prayer time over the years uh, that has allowed me to understand that I think that God has portrayed this and painted this picture as this is the best way to live. And so I'm going to do another podcast that's going to go down with what my Seeking Excellence philosophy, kind of where all of that actually came from, um, because I gave a talk on it once at Benedictine and it was really well received and Um, I think it could be really interesting for people to hear. So we will go into that eventually. And I also have this anti-excellence podcast that I'm going to be recording soon. That's going to be talking about like what a life of not excellence looks like, um, which is basically the average American life today, I think. Um, And a lot of other great ideas. But today we're talking about lessons learned from the last year. And so hopefully this helps you if you're if you're anything, if you're trying to commit to uh, losing weight, if you're trying to commit to actually start reading, if you're trying to commit to actually living your life as a Catholic, if you're considering starting a podcast, if you're considering starting a blog, if you're considering starting a social media outreach page, if you're considering starting um, anything, right, anything to change your life, I hope that this helps you as I've looked back on something that really was a brainchild for me when I was in college, initially, uh, this whole seeking excellence concept and idea and wanting to have a blog and a podcast and a ministry. Um, It was a long time coming and I felt like I waited for the right time. And I I honestly don't think I waited too long. Uh, I think that I started when God wanted me to, but I've definitely seen a lot of people who have waited too long. And so I want you to think about that because our first step, the first thing we're going to talk about today, I kind of have six main points. The first one is get started. So I think that uh, the first thing that's really important for you is you need to get started. You need to just start. And I think that sometimes we don't want to start small because we think it's embarrassing. We have these big goals, these big dreams. And even in Seeking Excellence at times, I've seen, you know, we've had to pull back whether myself or other members on the team where it's like we want to do everything at once and just be huge out of the gate. And it's like that doesn't always work that way. You know, I listen to the Order of Man podcast. I listen to him talk often. He's at like 90,000 followers on Instagram and a ton of people listen to his podcast and he sent shirts and uh, other, you know, apparel all over the world for his stuff. And he has great events. And he's like, dude, I've been doing this for like six or seven years, every week, a few episodes a week. Like that's a grind. You get, you don't get to that point right away, right? Like his first, second, third, fourth year, we're not like that. And so I think a lot of times, just like we want to do in the gym, just like we want to do financially, we always want that get rich quick scheme, right? And so I think it's important for us to acknowledge the fact that you just have to get started. And there's a few things that kind of hold us back from getting started, I think. One is obviously an unwillingness to like stick to the process, right? Um, Commit to the process, trust the process as, you know, the good old Philadelphia 76ers used to say. You have to trust the process. I mean, it's a real thing. It's a true thing. And I think you have to stick it out and be consistent. Um, And I kind of want to talk about that a little bit later. I had to keep pushing one, but that's one that I see a lot of people, especially when it comes to Catholic podcasters, kind of give up on is uh, th- that consistency and, and not Catholic podcasters alone. I've seen blog writers, all kinds of things, and we'll get more into that later. But first, you just need to get started. I, you know, I wanted to 
point to the the one semi cheesy Olympics commercial that's out right now that says you don't have to be amazing to start, but you have to start to be amazing, right? Because you're not going to be amazing out of the gate. You're not going to be super good at this. I remember uh, just the quality of the podcast at, at the beginning and uh, my ability to speak to a camera by myself, you know, for an hour or 45 minutes was really hard at first. And so I had to figure that out. And so I think one of the main things that keeps people from preve preventing people from getting started is imposter syndrome, right? I was just talking about this with uh, my friend Bob the other day, uh, who's been on the podcast twice. Hopefully you've heard the one we did on friendship. That's one of my favorites. But I was just talking about this with him because, uh, you know, he and his wife, his awesome wife, Sarah, who I also want to have as a guest sometime, um, she, they were kind of sharing about, uh, you know, wanting to get started in ministry in their parish and, and serve in certain ways and uh, either marriage ministry or a number of other ways. And um, they were talking about, you know, we've only been married a couple of years. Like, we don't want to kind of come out to this like high and mighty, like imposter syndrome stuff, you know, and, and or, or imposter stuff or try to act like we're somewhere that we're not, you know, because we're just figuring it out, but they're trying to build community, you know. And what I shared was, I was like, that always exists. So this is kind of why I started with what I did about me not having it all figured out, because I think that that's really important going into recognizing that you always feel that way, right? As, as you get to know more Catholic speakers, as you get to see behind the scenes of, of people who are really confident or successful in life, like you start to see like some people, this is why people don't want to do seeking excellence, right? This is why people don't want to seek excellence, I should say. It's because if you're, let's say a Gary V, right? You can show the world. And, and like, I've listened to a lot of Gary V and he's added value to my life, no doubt, but he's a business master right? If you look at Grant Cardone is another good example of this, a business master. If you were to go ahead and look behind the scenes at their life and say, okay, what's your spiritual life like? What's your relationship with your wife like or your kids? You know, what's your mental health like? Like there's a lot of good things in his seeking excellence. What's your view on social issues and how you kind of view those things and how you help to make the world a better place? Um, and I'm not judging them on any of those things, but I'm just saying that there could, there's, there's the ability for a lot of people to hone in on one area for them. It's mainly like business money and act like you're a master and then not ever show your weakness, right? Like you don't, you show one card, right? You got one ace, you got, you got one, you got one ace, one King, but you got seven cards in your hand when it comes to seeking excellence, when it comes to this modern day living and the other ones might be trash, but the ones that you're seeing from people look really, really good. And so you're always going to have that kind of imposter syndrome because if 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 only people with perfect marriages led any type of marriage groups or tried to build community in the church we wouldn't have any community or groups in the church if only people who were perfect tried to speak in the church we wouldn't have any catholic speakers if only people who are perfect tried to lead youth ministry and work in the parish and become priests and religious we wouldn't have any of those things because we don't have any perfect people we don't have any so we're fresh out so i think it's important to recognize that nobody's perfect now obviously I think there is a standard at which you should have if you're going to try to lead ministry, right? Like you should be striving to live in accordance with church teaching and like sincerely striving. So that means that you're not going to be on birth control trying to start a uh, marriage group at church, right? Like you shouldn't intentionally, actively always um, avoid, uh, or, you know, or break church teaching or live against church teaching. That wouldn't make sense, right? So Emily and I are not going to do stuff if we were living together right now as we're engaged we wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't be doing this even. Like uh, you would stop some of your, your ministry. That doesn't mean that you don't sin anymore, but it just means that you're not going to actively live against church teaching and then try to teach other people how to live in accordance with church teaching. I think that's a critical thing. But at the same time, recognizing that you're still sinning, if you're still struggling with sexual sin, chastity in your relationship, chastity with yourself, honesty, judging other people, your prayer life, whatever, like, a lot of times being a leader can help you grow in those things. And that's what I've come to see a lot of times. I'm like so many times I've volunteered to lead stuff and to be example for other people, almost not even for them, but because it helps me to be better, which also helps them because then I'm better helping them. You know what I mean? It's a reciprocal thing. So understand that you're always going to have that. It's a lie to think that you're going to, to be ready someday and you're going to be enough unless you're talking about living specifically against church teaching. Now that's something that if you have serious doubts and struggles in the faith, then yeah, maybe you don't, maybe you're not ready to lead if you're not willing to, I mean, if you're at a place where you shouldn't even be receiving communion on the weekend, 
then you probably shouldn't be leading in the church. I think that's fair to say and um, understandable enough. But other than that, if you're still growing and striving and going to confession and sincerely sorry for having offended the Lord in whatever ways that you do, then yeah, you can get started and, and, and you know, recognize that you're never going to be perfect. And the more sanctified and holy you get, the more ready you are to go to confession more regularly because you're more aware of your sin, not less aware of your sin. When you're living just immersed in all kinds of sin, you actually don't realize how effed up you are. It's when you start to get purified, you start to look at the face of Jesus every day, ponder his goodness, thank him in gratitude every day, spend time in prayer, go to mass more often, go to confession more regularly, that you start to see how messed up you are. You know, the great example that I've always heard with that is like one of a hoarder, right? Like if you ever watch hoarders on TV, which I'm a weirdo and I love that show. Um, it's disgusting most of the time. But if you ever watch hoarders, they're typically horrific, right? Like the, the, the houses are just gross, unbelievably gross. Cockroaches, bugs, dead animals, like all kinds of stuff, right? Fungus, it's, it's unsafe to live in there. But because it's so bad, they almost don't realize how bad it is, right? There's a lot of people in the world today. Now, think of your mom or maybe somebody you know, I know for me is my grandparents, who their house is like always perfect. And if you go in and there's like a newspaper out of place, they say, oh, I'm sorry, this place is a mess, right? So that's the difference. That's like, that's why Mother Teresa would go to confession every day or every other day. St. John Paul II, same thing. Because as you're getting more sanctified, you actually start to realize when things are out of place and when you're not doing the right thing much more often than if you're a hoarder and it's like, you have no idea where anything goes. The whole, the whole shit's a mess. So um, understanding that's really important. The next thing is that we lie to ourselves about. We believe that there's always going to be a good time eventually for us to start something. So I had a number of friends last year or in, and even before the pandemic hit, like in 2019, Friends who, you know, had good ideas for ministries, for blogs or vlogs or, you know, YouTube channels or podcasts, whatever it is, uh, who, who were just, you know, not right now, you know, I'm just kind of busy. I'm just trying to figure things out or whatever. And it's like they just waited and waited and waited and waited. And then it's like they, you just never do it. And I had to be really careful with that for Seeking Essence, as I kind of mentioned earlier, because I thought about this in college and I knew in the army it was legitimately impossible for me to do it. So I'm like, I'm going to the field very often you know and uh i'm preparing to deploy and all this stuff and i didn't want to start and stop so that's kind of how i had to pray and discern you know to feel like okay am i ready and it's not necessarily me saying that you need to start right now if you feel like you're genuinely discerning and saying that i'm not sure if i'm ready to begin or if god wants me to start you know leading in the church or being active in some way um, whatever specific way that is, we should all be active in the church in some regard, whether that's just setting up chairs for the parish festival or it's volunteering to lead youth ministry. There should be some active participation in the church. You should not just be going to mass on Sunday, right? Like you should be volunteering, obviously tithing to your parish, volunteering, getting active in your parish, uh, which I have not always been the best at. Um, it was really good when I was in the army and then moving a lot um, did not help me in uh, Cincinnati and then Kansas was kind of strange because it was kind of uh, we didn't really join a parish per se we just kind of did the college ministry and we did try to get involved in uh, a lot of college lives and, and disciple kids and things like that so but I think you know that was a bit of a tangent but I think that you need to be involved in your church in your parish but at the same time I think you have to recognize that what I'm not saying is that you necessarily need to start right now what I am saying is that you need to recognize that there's never going to be a good time to start you're busy, you travel, you have stuff to do. That's not going to change anytime soon. It's not going to get easier when you have kids. It's not going to be easier when you get married. I'm experiencing that now, even just being engaged because we see each other every day. And so when we spend time together every day, like not only is it, you know, viewed as a burden sometimes, right. To, to be like, well, I have to spend time with Emily tonight. So therefore I can't do X, but I, you know, the good thing is because we're getting married, I actively want to spend time with Emily. So uh, it's really nice, right? I really enjoy her presence. I like her company. Uh, I think she's great. I think she's great. Big fan. Um, but that, that kills your time. So it doesn't make it any easier. You know, I've never, ever recorded a podcast this early, but I'm trying to figure it out in Denver and I'm trying to figure out, all right, how can I still, still spend time with Emily tonight? Cause I have an SE uh, meeting to review some website updates and things like that later on tonight. Uh, I have some errands to run right after work, right? I want to go to the gym after work. So when can I record? 
I can record at 7 a.m. before I get started on work. And I worked from 10 to 11 last night to set myself up to be able to record at 7 a.m. today. And so I think that that's really important, too, to recognize that there's just never there's never a good time. And, and people make up these horseshit excuses and want to, you know, um, drag you down and, and, you know, not acknowledge your accomplishments or your feats because they want to say, oh, well, if, if I just had time to do that, I would. It's like, dude, I, I used to hear that in college all the time. And it's like by people who are less busy than me complaining that if they had my time, they would do things that I was doing, you know. And I just always think back to this Eric Thomas quote that I heard way back then in college when I was just grinding. And I remember Eric Thomas once saying that he's like, I have people come up to me all the time. Eric Thomas is my favorite motivational speaker, if you don't know that. He says, I got people coming up to me all the time. They say, Eric Thomas, I want to be a change agent. I want to impact people's lives. I want to speak. I want to do whatever. You know what I mean? I want to be a leader. Um, I want to do what you do. And he's like, no, you don't. He's like, you want what I have, but you don't want to do what I do. You don't want to wake up this early. You don't want to work this hard. You don't want to you know, still carve out time so you can have a good marriage. So you can have, be a good father and all this stuff. He's like, you don't want to do that. He's like, so stop lying to me and stop lying to yourself. So I think you have to recognize that there's never going to be a good time. It's hard. And I think that that's why I try to be more transparent in what I share here. Um, and I don't think I've been as transparent uh, in, in the recent couple months until a little bit today, hinting at just like the mental health challenges that I went through with all this transition and moving and traveling and um, I think I was just getting, you know, spiritual attacks and um, a time of desolation. And it was just really, really hard. And I think people don't see that stuff enough. And, and is there times where you need to, it gets so hard that you have to step away? Sure. And do we have to necessarily share every struggle, everything that we go through? No. But I think it's important for people to see that it's not just, you know, obviously on social media, people were like, oh, your life looks so great. looks amazing. And there was times where my life did look really good and was really amazing. I was still like, just unhappy and I didn't know why and I was tired and I was like going through it and my ankle started you know my Achilles started getting swollen again and I was like what is going on and all types of different issues right and all types of different blocks but um it's always going to be hard it's always you know it's not easy you don't wait for some perfect time and and you create that time you create the environment that's going to make it easier for you to do what God's calling you to do right and you find that routine that should you can get up at 7 a.m and, and record a podcast on a Tuesday Instead of saying, well, I got to wait till there's this perfect Saturday or whatever. Like I, I've, I've been there, I've done that. And it's, it's just a bunch of BS. And you're just making excuses. So the other thing I think is, is like, I just kind of mentioned that that keeps us from getting started is that uncertainty is you really sometimes just have to figure it out as you go. We made a mistake early in the podcast days where the podcast wasn't available on Apple podcasts until three weeks after we launched, I was pissed. <laughs> because like 65, 70% of our listens come from Apple. And so we kind of had this whole big launch planned and everything was great. I didn't know that podcasts took like three weeks to get approved by Apple. Who knew? And so it was just on Spotify when we launched. But I think, you know, that's, that's, you live and you learn that I don't regret starting on August 22nd, just because I didn't have my stuff on Apple until September 12th. You, that's just part of life, right? Like you just figure it out as you go. There's certain things that you, you strive and you say, we were very consistent at the beginning of we had podcasts going, you know, one, one week, three, the next week, all kinds of stuff. Right. And now we're finally getting to a place where, you know, one a week during the summertime and two a week throughout the rest of the year and figured out a way to do that and balance with the team. So I think you have to recognize, you know, my point number two uh, is that it ebbs and flows. Spiritual warfare is real. The way that you feel at the beginning is not necessarily the way that you're going to feel at the middle. Um, I think that's true in our relationship with God. It's true in our relationship with our spouse or significant other. It's true in our fitness, right? Like when you feel sometimes you're eager and excited to go to the gym and you're halfway through the workout and you're just like, yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that happens all the time. The same thing's true in ministry. Or sometimes you get started and it's like really fun podcasting at first and people are giving you a ton of good feedback. And now I feel like we've kind of gotten to the point where a lot of the people who were listening because they knew me at first have stopped. And now we kind of are like developing this listener base of people who have kind of just found the podcast throughout the year, which is awesome. You know, and obviously I still have friends. I know my cousin Gavin takes a lot of pride in having listened to every Seeking Excellence podcast ever. Um, and, and there's a lot of people who are close to me who still listen every now and then, but there's a lot of people who are really close to me who have stopped and that's okay. 
you know, but like that, that encouragement, the, the, the podcast is really good today. Those stop coming in as often. Right. I mean, I still am, am grateful to get it from strangers and people who are still listening to the podcast and the numbers are still going up. So it's great to see that, but it's, it's just, you know, things change and, and it ebbs and flows and your motivation changes. And um, I think that's one of the main ways that, you know, you're growing in discipline is when you're not as motivated as you once were, but you're still going. You're still getting it done. You're still getting after it. And I think that's really critical for us to do as people, especially people who want to seek excellence, because you're not always going to be feeling it. It's not always going to be feeling good. You're not going to feel like doing the things that you need to do. It's easy to just chill and relax and ignore your responsibilities. The other thing that I think that I've learned, number three, is, is to put first things first. What that means, it's one of the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey, a book that I often recommend to people. And what that means is that even in the midst of all of this, right, I'm talking, you know, of getting started, of not making excuses, of recognizing that it ebbs and flows, you're not always going to be motivated. It's just to make sure you're putting first things first. I think one of the things that destroys people in ministry, luckily, I read this book right before starting uh, Seeking Excellence was The Soul of the Apostolate. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing book. Uh, God bless Emily for giving it to me. Um, is I think, you know, what that book really talks about is just the importance of your prayer and interior life if you're going to do anything exterior. And so I see, I've seen it a lot. It really um, troubles me. It really is something that I uh, struggle with is I've worked with parishes. I now work a lot with schools and still with parishes. But there's so many people, Catholic school teachers, Catholic parish staff, priests, uh, you know, people working in ministry who don't pray, who don't have spiritual lives. And mine's ebbed and flowed since I've worked in ministry for these last two years now, which is crazy to think about, but for two years and you just kind of get to see that, but you have to put those first things first. And that means your prayer for me, you know, I always say prayer, fitness and, and, um, and reading. And so striving to do those things. So you balance it out, right? So it's like, I have these responsibilities. I have a job that demands a lot. I have the ministry, the podcast, and, and these other things that we're trying to do and get started in writing. And, but I still have to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, carve out that time and make sure I'm spending time with Emily. So to make sure I'm spending time in prayer. So to make sure that I'm reading and working out because it'd be easy to make this mistake of going all in on seeking excellence and then living a life that's very not excellent seeking right myself because i'm so focused on creating content and doing things and trying to build the the mission and build the brand and all this stuff that i just kind of let everything else fall to the wayside and then it's like well how am i going to lead this if i'm not doing it and so you have to put first things first and try to figure out how can i do it all right that's the entrepreneur the entrepreneurial kind of um creativity that's needed to live this life of excellence to live this life of modern day holiness and being a good steward of everything that's entrusted to you. It's kind of seeing your life as almost as a business um, and not seeing your people in relationships as a business. Of course, I think even in good business, you have empathy. If you listen to Gary Vee or Simon Sinek, right? Like that should be a part of business much more than it is. Um, and I'm blessed to work for a company like Halo where it is and relationships really matter. But I think you have to kind of see it like that and say, okay, these are our tasks. This is what we do as an organization. How can we best manage our efficiency and our effectiveness to, to be really good at this? So put first things first, make sure you're keeping your priorities in line. Um, one of the next one is uh, just setting high standards, right? So, I, you know, and, and I don't know anybody else's situation. I don't know what people are going through or what changed for them. But as I kind of mentioned earlier, I've seen a lot of people start blogs and stop start Instagram pages and stop, start, you know, ministry things and stop, start volunteering and stop, start podcasts and stop. Like one thing that I was really committed to, and maybe this will change someday, but it's not changing anytime soon is I just didn't want to have seasons on the podcast. I always kind of viewed it as like seasons were just people's way of taking a cheap time out and being like, I don't want to do this right now. And I'm busy or I'm going through transition or whatever, but unless it's like a family emergency and I mean like a, a legit emergency that's like a shock that lasts for a long time, you kind of know when things are going to happen, <laughs> right? So like I knew I was going on a four-week road trip in June 
And we still put out two podcasts a week. Why? Because I knew that was coming up. And I knew I wasn't going to take my mic. I was going to work on other things while I was gone, but I wasn't going to record. And so we never missed a week in there because of that. You know, thanks be to God um, for prudence and just getting ready, right? Like, so you know when this stuff is happening, but what don't people want to do? People don't want to record 10 podcasts in the span of three weeks or whatever it was a month to get that far ahead. Now, uh, it's a challenge. It's difficult to do. And, I, and I'm not saying that some people aren't called the seasons off or taking time or whatever, but I don't feel like that's what's best for the ministry. I don't feel like that's what's best for our listeners. And so I'm not going to just make it about me. I'm going to find ways to balance and have my mental health and my spiritual health and things like that while also creating content and helping to form people and lead people. Now, one thing that I think is really important in these last two of the key pushing to the difficulty and the adversity uh, and setting high standards is having a good team. So I've also talked with a lot of podcasters and they're always surprised that I'm not the one who edits my podcast. Shout out to Seth, the guy on the intro, Seth Slayman. He's now uh, a co-host, a guest host of the podcast. So that's pretty dope. Um, but Seth is a hero. Marissa Lennon, absolute MVP of Seeking Excellence. She runs uh, all social media, does a ton of other stuff. Uh, Melissa Gunkel now has been working and doing a lot of great stuff for us. Um, we've had uh, my boy Lucas Walschlager does a ton of stuff. Josie Coleman, another guest host. Uh, Leanne Leary does a lot of editing for the blog and things like that and, and just kind of runs all of that. Lucas crushes the weekly newsletter, which you need to sign up for if you have it at those who seek.org. And go check out our new updated website, all the, the dope stuff we have on there. But if you think about it, like we have a whole squad of people who are helping with these things. So I don't have to say when I record a podcast, man, I got to create the social media graphic, got to edit the podcast, got to do all this. I can just record and I do a lot of outreach. And there's still a lot of stuff that has to go on with that. And it's obviously it can be hard to record for this long, you know, on a consistent basis, but it makes it a lot easier when I'm splitting the task and sharing with people who also see the vision, who also appreciate the ministry and who also just kind of get it. And so that allows you to keep pushing through the difficult times. It's going to be hard. It's going to be challenging. You're not going to feel like doing it. You're not going to feel like doing those things. But if you have a team, right, and you have good people who are inspired and motivated and encourage you to be your best, it's going to be a lot easier. You're not meant to go it alone. You're not meant to do this alone. You cannot survive and do the Christian life by yourself. You have to have a good team around you. That goes for life. That's not just for working in ministry or doing anything like this. So Think about that. Who's going to be your team? Who's going to be your squad? Who's going to help you along the way to help lighten the burden for you so that you can stay focused and you can do the things that you're called to do, the things you were created for? You need to have that good team. You need to um, you know, encourage them and bring them around you, bring them in close and be willing to experiment and try different things and try something like having guest hosts or all these other things that we've kind of experimented with throughout the year as we try to figure it out. I think there's always this desire to like, like I said, to, to present yourself to the world as if you have everything set and you have everything ready and figured out. And it's just not the way to live. It's just not the way to do it. So yeah. So I just want to close with just thanking everybody. Uh, thanking all of you who have listened to the Seeking Excellence podcast, everybody who shared it on your story. If you shared it uh, with a friend in person, if you shared it via text, like, any of that stuff, man. We're so grateful for you. We're so grateful for all that you've done to help us, to help advance the mission, advance the message. Uh, we're excited to continue bringing you great content for the next, um, you know, whoever knows how long, uh, but not stop it anytime soon. I highly encourage you, as I said at the beginning, to go and check out our updated website. We just did a lot of great stuff, renovated the website, um, and launched some exciting new things. And so seriously, if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, please do, those who seek.org. We've got a great newsletter program now that's going to be a lot more intentional content that's going to be formed around the seven pillars, a lot more practical stuff um, that we're really excited to share with you guys. So thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, I, I pray for you. I, I hope that you're praying for me and just know that this life is hard. It gets tough, um, but you're made for this time. You're made to be where you're at right now. And if God created you, he's not going to abandon you. And he's going to give you the grace that you need to continue to fight hard and fight hard to the very end. So go out there and continue to strive to be your best. God bless.